In April 1943, during the dark days of World War II, four teenage boys in Birmingham made a terrifying discovery. Unsolved for over 70 years, it's a murder case that continues to both baffle and surprise investigators to this day. Almost all of the significant evidence has disappeared. Why is material being withheld? There were people out there who must know something. There were a number of people associated with the case who didn't want to talk about it. The reason that the police were unable to identify her was because she was a German spy. Wilhelm Hermann Goering. I think it's a very fertile ground, conspiracy theorist. He wound an electric flex, electric wire around. No home in the world, unattached. He had not committed suicide, but that he had been murdered. Defendants make final statements to the tribunal. Ich selbst möchte aber hier ganz aus der Tiefe meines... Birmingham the West Midlands. Today, the second largest and most populous city in Britain, a thriving and crucial hub of industry and culture. But during the Second World War, between 1940 and 1943, Birmingham had been identified as a place of huge interest by Nazi Germany. Birmingham was the second biggest city in Britain. It was also a major manufacturer of war industries like ball bearings, all sorts of metal products for aircraft and other parts, it was almost as important as London itself in terms of manufacturing capacity. During the Birmingham Blitz, the German Luftwaffe dropped over 100 tons worth of bombs on the city, including high explosives, parachute mines, and incendiaries. Then it came. That's the sound that became part of the life of every man, woman, and child in Britain. I remember the first air raid when they used the sirens. I went outside with my parents and I made my father turn his pipe upside down in case the plane saw him smoking. So, as a child, we were afraid. We were afraid of the German aeroplanes. If we were coming home from school and the plane came over, we hid in the hedges in case they bombed or shot us. We were frightened. We were frightened. The Birmingham Blitz was fairly severe. And, of course, it wasn't just Birmingham that was hit. It was Coventry and Wolverhampton as well because of manufacturing plants there. A lot of damage being done every night. A lot of residents, if they had the ability, were getting out of Birmingham at night and sometimes sleeping in laybys during the summer months just to avoid the blitz. There were artillery batteries deployed around Birmingham, anti-aircraft units. It was the scene of a mini blitz, not quite on the scale of London, but certainly massively significant to the war effort. Numerous factories, houses, and buildings were destroyed in the raids, and over 2,000 people lost their lives. But in addition to the devastating aerial bombardments, Birmingham was also the scene of industrial espionage, Nazi spies, and a wartime murder, all of which are linked by a gruesome discovery. In April 1943, a group of local boys were in Hagley Wood, part of the Hagley Estate in wartime Birmingham. There were four young men, teenagers, who were looking for bird's nests in the woods. They wanted the eggs. As they searched the surrounding trees and bushes, young Bob Farmer noticed the stump of an old witch elm. Thick with new sprouting branches, it seemed the ideal place to look for hidden nests. One of them discovered what he thought was some animal bones. He was rather horrified when he hooked it out and it was a human skull. It was a skull with a bit of hair on it. It looked horrible. 
And when he saw what it was, I think it frightened him. And they knew they were trespassing. They would have been in trouble if a keeper had caught them or anybody had. Unsure what to do next, but fearing reprisals from the fact they had been trespassing, Bob returned the skull and they made a pact. The boys told each other they must never tell anybody. They realized that if they went and reported it, that they would be in trouble, because why were they there? But Tom Willits, the youngest of the four, was uneasy about what they had discovered. When they got home, one of them told their uncle something about it, and he realized it was probably serious. They wouldn't have made that up. And because it was wartime, they were suspicious. Willits returned to the woods to guide a police officer to the location of the witch elm. And any doubts the police had about the boy's story were soon laid to rest. Once the matter was reported to the police, an officer came out with one of the boys to have a look at the site and realized that he'd got something that was real and it needed investigating. Because the boys hadn't just discovered a skull, they had discovered the complete remains of a murder victim. The area was quickly turned into a crime scene. But almost from the start, it became clear that this was not going to be a normal investigation. You mustn't leave a murder site unattended. They had to find somebody to attend the site all night. Peter Douglas Osborne is a local Birmingham councillor. His father, Eric, was at home on leave from the RAF when he was called to assist at the scene. In April 1943, my father was at home on leave. He was the nearest ex-police special constable who could be sent to the site, who would have the necessary background to realize how important it was that the body should be preserved, ready for officers to pick up the remains in order to do a proper autopsy. They sent for specialists, they sent for forensic scientists from uh, Birmingham University, and they sent four senior police officers to investigate the scene. When the investigators arrived, Eric was excused from the scene. But for some reason, something he had either seen or heard that night gave him cause to remain silent. My father did not want to talk about it. He had no speculation that he was prepared to discuss and basically clammed up. He told me um, it was a closed subject and uh, I, there was no point in, in asking him anything about it. There were a number of other people associated with the case who also decided that they didn't want to talk about it. They may have thought that it was a, a, an issue of national security. There had recently been reports of a German parachute found in the Clent Hills, close to Hagley Wood. Could the authorities have suspected a link between the parachute and the body found in the tree? News of the discovery of a body soon spread around the area, and the newspapers were quick to run with the story. I was at school, and it was in the local press, the County Express. And in those days, there weren't many murders reported in the papers. The public wanted answers, and an investigation was soon underway. The remains, comprising of bones and fragments of clothing, was sent for examination to pathologist Professor James Webster and Dr. John Lund of the West Midlands Forensic Science Laboratory. Professor Webster and Dr. Lund were charged with doing a complete forensic examination of the body. Webster was quickly able to establish that the remains were that of a woman between 35 to 40 years old, but could find no obvious signs of injury or cause of death. It was springtime, plants were growing. This is how they knew how long they knew it had been since she'd been killed. 
By measuring the growth of the plants around the remains, Webster was able to determine that the body had been placed in the tree 18 months prior to discovery. Dr. Lund was tasked with investigating the items found around the bones. His son, Richard Lund, inherited the detailed diaries his father had kept from his time working on the case. My father, Dr. Lund, worked on the case when he was a forensic biologist working at the West Midlands Forensic Laboratory in Birmingham. When my father was asked to look at these remains by Webster, he recorded in his diary that this was an extraordinary case because the bones had been found in, in the tree. Wednesday, the 21st of April, 1943, a most extraordinary case came in. Last evening, Webster went to examine a very large hollow tree stump, about five and a half feet high, in which children had found some bones. From this tree, Webster extracted an almost complete skeleton and some much rotted clothing. My job is to see how much I can learn from these remnants. It will be an interesting but very difficult task. This can hardly be anything other than homicide. Murder was clear, but who had killed her and why? Had they been motivated by a purely criminal intent? Or was her death somehow linked to the war effort? Painstakingly, Dr. Lund reconstructed an identification fit to include the clothes she was wearing at the time of her murder. With the forensic analysis complete, it was now up to the police to identify who this woman was and how she came to be found in the stump of a witch elm in Hagley Wood. Two shoes were found when they were exploring the wood. One was found a little way away from the tree, and one was found in the hollow underneath the bones. They traced 600 pairs of shoes. And they were dark blue shoes, and they, were, they got crepe soles. The shoes were manufactured in sometime in 1940, and they had had at least six months' hard wear. They traced all but six pairs, but six pairs had been sold in the market. Despite intensive investigation, the police were unable to trace the remaining pairs of shoes to any missing persons. They now pinned their hopes of identifying the remains on a forensic technique relatively new to the time, dental records. They were quite hopeful. Her teeth were very odd. They were crossed. She'd had a tooth out within the last 12 months. So if we go around all the dentists, we shall find some records of that. So what was at first sent out to all the dentists, the registered dentists in England, was a photograph of the lower jaw. And they were asking whether that could be checked against dental records to identify who the woman was. They thought from those clues, they'd probably discover who she was. They went around, oh, about a 1,000 dental people. They couldn't find anything. They got very frustrated. They did try for a long time. They tried very hard. Finding no match for the shoes, dental records, or missing persons lists, the police were at a loss. What we're talking about, of course, is a cold case. By the time the police found the skeleton, uh, she had been dead at least 18 months. There are no witnesses. Nobody saw anybody put the body into a tree. There were precious few clues to follow up, and there were real resource issues in wartime. And at some point, the police investigation was getting nowhere, and it ran out of steam. The ongoing war effort meant a huge strain on the police and forensic services. Due to the increasing number of new cases coming in every day, the investigation into the body found in the witch elm was ceased. Until the sudden appearance of graffiti in the local area sparked renewed interest in the mystery. The police around here tried very hard for two or three years, and they didn't get very far. And then all of a sudden, somebody reported some writing on a wall. Who put Bella in the witch elm? And it, it went 
around the area, on walls, on the back of buildings. Soon, cryptic messages containing Hagley Wood and variations of the name Bella suddenly started appearing on walls and fences around the West Midlands. In Hasbury, in Birmingham, in Oldbury, graffiti on walls asking, essentially, who put Bella or Clara Bella in the witch elm. It didn't take long for both the police and the public to make the link between the graffiti and the remains found in Hagley Wood. But who had written it? What did they know about the case? And was Bella the real name of the woman found in 1943? And so they, they, they started to get interested again, because they had to. It was obvious that somebody knew something. Somebody was saying something. And they tried to find what that was. They had the chalk analyzed, and they found, to their horror, that it was used by every pub to chalk up the darts matches in the pubs. It was that sort of chalk, so it didn't help them. So they started to look for Bellas in the missing people's lists. And they looked at all the other sorts of Bella, Lou Bella, Isabella. They went after one here after another, but they just could not find out who'd done it or, or what it was about. The mystery got deeper, and, and lots and lots of stories became attached to it. In particular, the possibility that the reason that the police were unable to identify her was because she was not British, she was not English, that she was a German spy. But why would people suspect that the remains belonged to a Nazi spy? And why would her body have been hidden in a hollowed out tree in a remote Birmingham woodland? Naturally, armaments factories in particular, military bases and places where war materials were manufactured were a prime target for espionage. The whole history of Second World War espionage for the Germans isn't focused purely on the southeast. If it had been, you know, the bombing campaign would have focused on just the southeast. That's the heart of government, yes. But you have got manufacturing capacity, you've got docks, you've got important military targets right across the country. And the Germans would have wanted to know what was happening not just in London, but in Liverpool, in Manchester, in Birmingham. And so therefore Birmingham was a legitimate military target. It was one that was a target for spying. And we can be very clear that there were German spies operating within the West Midlands. But in a really successful coup by the British Secret Services, they rounded up virtually all of them. And those that the Nazis and the Germans infiltrated into the country, either by sea or parachuting from the air, were very swiftly rounded up. It's one of the advantages of Britain uh, being an island, and at that time a linguistically and racially homogenous island, that strangers were very easy to spot and easy to, to apprehend. Many spies were captured during wartime, but one in particular, Joseph Jacobs, may have provided a clue to solving the mystery. His granddaughter, Canadian-born Gigi Jacobs, has been researching Joseph's life for many years, including his connection to the remains of the woman now known as Bella. My grandfather was Joseph Jacobs. He was a German. He came here in January 31st, 1941. He was parachuted into England as a German spy. He was sent to send back weather reports. Unfortunately, when he landed, he broke his ankle quite badly. So he lay there all night, and then he was found the next morning by some farmers, and he was interrogated for several months by MI5. And on August 15th, 1941, he was taken to the Tower of London where he was executed by firing squad. Jacobs holds a place in history for being the last ever person to be executed at the Tower of London. But before his execution, Jacobs had been interrogated at length by MI5, the records of which have only recently been declassified. 
He was picked up having been parachuted into the country by the Germans as a spy. He failed to report back to radio contact. Uh, he was picked up before he could, and he was interrogated. The MI5 files, the interrogation files, they have quite a bit of questioning of him on his previous life. He got into a lot of trouble. Gold counterfeiting, prison sentence in Switzerland, black market passport fraud in Berlin, and he was sent to a concentration camp for that. In his possession, he had a picture of a woman called Clara Bauer, who was a singer, a German singer. She'd been in some films, very attractive woman. And there was a personal message from Clara on the back. My dear, dash, dash, I love you forever, yours, Clara. Landau, July 1940. MI5 was very interested in this postcard. They were like, who is this woman? Why, is she, why do you have her postcard? And he eventually admitted that she was his mistress and a German cabaret singer. Clara Bauler was a German-born recording artist and actress. <laughs> Having starred in a number of films, she was a minor celebrity in Nazi Germany and, as such, was well-connected to those in power. What Jacobs? told his interrogators at the time was that this woman had um, connections, senior connections with the Nazi party, uh, that her former lover, de deceased, uh, had been a U-boat captain, and that she had volunteered to spy, that she spoke English, and that she would in many ways have made an ideal spy. The story was that she would be parachuted into the West Midlands once Jacobs reported back that the coast was clear and that he was established and safe. He had a, a transmitter and he was supposed to radio back when he got here and got set up and then they were going to send Clara after him. Could Clara Bella actually have been a German spy called Clara Bowler? The pieces of the puzzle seemed to be coming together. It did seem plausible. The Germans were sending uh, quite a few agents over via parachute in, in late 1940, early to mid-1941. So the idea that they had sent over Clara Bauerle as a, a spy was not outside the realm of possibility, for sure. And the area around Birmingham was definitely uh, of interest to the Germans. There was a belief that a parachute had been discovered, that it was of German manufacture, that somebody had parachuted into the West Midlands, close to, to the Clent Hills, and that that person was at large, because they were never discovered. Dr. Webster's pathology report had estimated the date of death of the woman found in Hagley Wood to be between 1940 and 1941. So investigations were made to determine Clara Bowler's whereabouts during this period. Clara had a recording career. It started probably in 1938, that she had, um, she was singing with, the, with these big bands. She also was singing for a record label called Tempo. Uh, they would record recordings in Berlin and the recording stopped, which made some people very suspicious because what happened to her, that's right around that time that, that they, Dr. Webster suspected that Bella had been murdered. The date of death coincided with the fact that no further record of Clara Bowler could be found after 1941. But why would the Nazis have sent a cabaret singer to spy in the West Midlands? MI5 had posed that very question and searched for any connection that Bowler may have had to Britain before the war. So MI5 had done some background research. They looked in the home office records for any information that Clara Bowler, the German cabaret singer, had, had been to England before. And they found a Clara Sophie Bowerle, who was born June 29th, 1906, and who had come to England in 1930 and left in 1932. They had three strands of proof, the first being Joseph Jacobs' story, the second being uh, that this woman's career in Berlin had stopped in the 1940s. Well, if she died in late 1940, 1941 in, in Britain, then that would explain that, and that there was no record of her in Berlin after that time. 
it all seemed to fit together that Clara Bauerle had actually been sent over to England and had somehow ended up dead in a, you know, and stuffed in a witch elm. The mystery seemed to have been solved and the tantalizing prospect that her grandfather's lover had in fact been the woman found in Hagley Wood in 1943 led Gigi to further research the life of Clara Bowler, which turned up some surprising information. I came across one reference on the internet, her birth date and her death, and it said she died December 16th, 1942. So I requested her death certificate. It turned out that Clara Bowler, real name Hedwig Clara Bowler, had died in Munich of an accidental overdose in 1942. For me, it's, it's clear. You know, Clara Bauerle, the German cabaret singer, died in Berlin December 16, 1942, of a very tragic overdose. And, and she is definitely not Bella in the witch elm. So the Joseph Jacob story is a red herring. It seemed plausible, actually, at the time but it didn't stand up to examination. So if the remains in the tree were not Clara Bowler's, whose were they? The mystery of the skeleton in the witch elm remained unsolved, but links with Nazi spying continued. Over 60 years after he had originally worked on the case, Dr. John Lund found himself once again delving into the mystery. When Dad had this case, as he wrote in his diary, he did recognize it as being an exceptional case at the time, presumably because of the body being in the tree, which obviously was a very unusual situation. But he had no idea that it was going to become as famous as it has become, really, for him. It was just another case that he worked on, and then he was on to the next case. It was only when he came to review his diaries from that time in uh, around about 2004 that he came across this case again. And it obviously attracted his interest because it was still a very unusual case. And for some reason he checked on the internet and then he discovered how famous it had become. Like everybody else, he became a bit obsessed about it. You know, it, it really is a bottomless mystery. He actually uses the word seduced in one of his writings. He became seduced by some of the other theories and began to entertain that they could be credible did at one point say that he thought that the spy theories might have something about them, and particularly um, the one about Mossop and Van Rout. In the 1950s, a local newspaper received an anonymous letter purporting to know not only the identity of the remains, but also the identity of the murderer. The police were aware from the graffiti that there were people out there who must know something about who Bella was and how she got there. But they didn't get any concrete leads at the time until a woman who was writing to the newspaper under the uh, nom de plume Anna of Claverley made a declaration about the case. And at first she was saying, the case is closed, the person who did it is dead, uh, I know that this is true. You're wasting your time investigating this. Go away. The police tracked down the so-called Anna of Claverley and insisted she provided them with a statement about the information she had and revealed the identity of those involved. Anna of Claverley, whose real name was Una Hainsworth, formerly Una Mossop. It was her ex-husband, Jack Mossop, that she was talking about. And she said that Jack Mossop had been hanging around with a, a Dutchman named Van Ralt. Her estranged husband had befriended a Dutchman who had a lot of money and appeared to be spreading it about to get information about what was happening in the munitions factory. So if he existed, he was almost a his mine. It was suspected that Van Rout had been working for the Nazis tasked with gathering information on the Birmingham factories, producing arms, aircrafts, and ammunition for the war effort. The reason why Birmingham would have been of real interest to Nazi spies during the Second World War 
is because they would have been interested in knowing how efficient the bombing campaign was. They were trying to hit munitions factories, manufacturing plants, car manufacture. There is also a separate issue because there was research going on at Birmingham University into atomic bomb production, very top secret. And so any spy worth their soul would have wanted to know that that was happening. Una Mossop also revealed during the interview that her husband Jack had been a local factory worker, but she had seen him leave the house several times wearing an RAF uniform. She went on to suggest that he may have been involved in gathering information for Van Ralt. Jack Mossop and this man, Van Ralt, were drinking in a local pub with the Dutchman's girlfriend, who was also Dutch, and that a row broke out. Maybe she knew too much or discovered something she shouldn't have. But Una Mossop claimed that Van Raut had felt that his girlfriend was becoming a liability. At some point, the Dutchman killed her, and the two men were saddled with a body, and that they did so by putting the body in a hollow tree. But after the event, Jack Mossop struggled to deal with what he had done and confessed his involvement in the murder to his ex-wife. He had come to her in quite a state and said that um, he was having nightmares um, because he and this Van Rolt guy had stuffed this woman in a tree. Jack told her he was having a recurring nightmare. He would find himself back in Hagley Wood confronted by the tree he and Van Ralt had used to hide the girl's body. There is now evidence to suggest that Jack Mossop was clearly struggling with his demons. As records show, he spent the remainder of his life in an asylum. There's rumors that he committed suicide at a, at a, at a mental hospital. I did actually order his death certificate, and he died essentially of insanity. Um, the death certificate says softening of the brain and then chronic kidney disease. Uh, and then insanity. So uh, he did die in a mental institution in Staffordshire. Was Jack telling the truth? Had he been involved in the murder of a Dutch spy's girlfriend? Or was it just the ramblings of a disturbed mind? It does have some possible merit to it because we know that we couldn't find this woman from the dental checks that were taken at the time. So if she had come from the continent, if she wasn't registered with a dentist in this country, maybe had not been in this country very long, it's one possible reason why they couldn't trace her. And indeed, if she was murdered by one of the few people who knew her, to wit, the boyfriend, the Dutchman, he wouldn't have reported her as missing. Who would? The police made some basic inquiries into Una Mossop's statement, but fell short of finding any real information to corroborate her story. It's an intriguing lead. And what I find interesting, and it's one of the reasons why the police files are so frustrating, is that the police didn't track down any of this information. They tracked down all sorts of information on the shoes, but nothing on, on a lead like Van Rolt. There is pretty well no supporting evidence as to who Van Ralt was, the friendship with Jack Mossop, what they did, and most importantly of all, who the supposed Dutch woman actually was. It's quite a plausible story, and it might well be the truth, but proving it is something else. Due to the mysterious circumstances surrounding the remains and links to Nazi spies, the case has gained the interest of generations of historians, journalists, and amateur researchers. 
many of whom called for the case to be officially reopened. But there was a problem. Almost all of the significant evidence that was held by the police or the National Forensic Service at Birmingham University has disappeared. The body itself has disappeared, the skeleton. There are none of the bones available to us. Even the report from the coroner, 1943, is missing. The coroners had destroyed the report of the inquest. Apparently, they have a policy of um, destroying documents after only 15 years of this particular coroner's. Dad was, in a way, more astonished by that than by the bones going missing because it was, you know, intentional. It wasn't sort of an accident. They actually deliberately destroyed the records. Astonishingly, even parts of the police report had vanished from the archives. I actually did order a copy of the police files from the Worcestershire archives. And they're intriguing for what isn't there more than for what is there. The actual crucial material, you know, the witness statements of the boys who found the, the, the skeleton, of anyone who was involved in, in collecting the bones, of interviewing people within the community, all that is not in the police files. He did say to me one day, he did say, you know, because as he went on and found so many things had disappeared, he began to think that perhaps the cover-up theory had some merit to it after all, you know, that it was, it was a plausible thing. The only thing he couldn't work out was what was being covered up. The fact that the majority of the evidence has disappeared has caused some to speculate on the involvement of the security service. They suspected that she was a spy or that she was in some way tang entangled with Britain's security services, that there might still be military secrets or issues which have caused the establishment to close ranks and to suppress as much of the evidence as was necessary. Ten years after the discovery of the bones, Peter's father, Eric, decided to reveal a conversation that took place between himself and members of the security service. When my father had come back from service in Italy uh, at the end of the war, he had um, come back with a group of Canadian RAF intelligence experts. In passing, Eric had told them he was from Hagley in Birmingham. Surprisingly, they were familiar with the area due to an investigation they had been involved with in 1943. They happened to know about the case and confirm that, uh, that they had uh, researched it. They knew that a spy had been sent to England. They'd been following up uh, quite a number of details, looking for some sort of connection. They had researched all the dentists and dental records in the country uh, and come to the conclusion that there was no such work that matched uh, anybody who was British at the time. The conclusion was that she was a spy. What they did not tell him was exactly what she was um, spying about. With so many years having passed and nearly all the useful evidence missing, Will we ever find out just who Bella was and how she ended up in a hollowed out tree in Hagley Wood? At this point, it's very unlikely that it'll really ever be solved. The culprit is probably long dead. Witnesses are long gone. The, the bones of Bella are, are lost or misplaced or something. The police files, there's at least two folders that were not released to the archives, so it makes me wonder what's in them. The only thing worth researching is where the bones are. If the bones could be rediscovered, then we have the, the DNA techniques which didn't exist back in the day. But without the bones, you know, it's a dead end. While most of the key evidence is missing, earlier this year, an author contacted Face Lab, part of Liverpool John Moores University, and asked them to attempt to reconstruct what Bella may have looked like. Face Lab have an international reputation in facial reconstruction, having worked with countless museums, Interpol, 
and even the FBI. This case has been really interesting, but also quite challenging. Unfortunately, we could only work from photographic evidence that still exists. We had to find a way of combining the information that we had to get the best possible outcome for a depiction. That involved taking different quality images of different parts of the skull and bringing them together to create a one image of a skull. When that was finished, that then allowed us to be able to assess the facial features. So, for example, we would look at the orbits to give us information about the eyes. We look at the teeth to give us information about the lips. We look at the nasal aperture, the whole of the skull, to tell us about the nose. And the overall proportions of the skull will give the overall proportions of the face. And that enables us then to, to build anatomically the structures of the face directly onto the image of the skull and then finish with a finished facial appearance. Incredibly, by using only the remaining photos in the police file, the team at Face Lab have finally been able to reveal the face of the woman who has come to be known as Bella. The one thing that we can't have got going for us now is the facial reconstruction done. That enables us to ask people to look in their family archives. Could it have been your relative is the question. So I don't think the mystery will be solved easily, but at least we've got an avenue to follow up now. I would love to believe that Bella was the girlfriend of a Dutch spy and that she was killed in a particular macabre fashion and that there was something really unusual about her death. I suspect the only unusual thing is that the bones were secreted in a hollow tree. Whether or not there's something being hidden, that's, that's, a, whole, that's a whole other thing. You know, has everything been released? No, I don't think so. And my question then would be why? Why is material being withheld? Another opinion that Dad had, which I think is, is probably quite a common one, was about how did they know the tree was there? How did the person know the tree existed? Um, you'd be very lucky to go into a wood with a dead body and just happen to find a suitable tree to hide it in. So Dad took the view that whoever put the body in the tree must have already known about it. Who knew about that tree? If we're looking for the culprit, it might be someone far closer to Hagley Wood. Was she just a poor, unfortunate local woman who ran afoul of someone? Possible. I have some ideas of my own, but I, I don't know that they're any better than somebody else's. Right? In one sense, one hopes it's never solved because the folklore, the mystery, the stories actually around it are probably far stronger than whatever the reality is.